It has been an incredibly rewarding day because I would, from every speaker and every panel, it's, it's ha offered the opportunity to think differently about the challenges that we face uh, as a nation and as a planet. And so I, 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 um, I've, t I've taken a number of, uh, of notes over the course of the day, but I, I do not want to take time away from our uh, distinguished panelist, General Polakowski. Ma'am, thank you for being here. This is the opportunity, the capstone panel, we have an opportunity to talk with General Polakowski about the future, the threats we face, how the approaches that we will take, and how, what are the things that we need to do as a nation in order to preserve our world leadership? Ma'am, uh, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Thank you, Mike. Uh, opening comments. Well, first of all, I want to thank you and for the invitation to come and speak. This has been an amazing day. I've sat this whole day and listened to some really fascinating discussion with some very distinguished uh, um, co-speakers, and I'm, I'm very grateful for having that opportunity and also an opportunity to, to see so many of our, 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 our young um, national security professionals here. Um, I think the focus of this particular talk is the frame to, to, to what um, General Mueller said, which is, um, global leadership. Is the United States a global leader? And I think I would argue that we are, but I think it's important as we start this to frame what we mean by leadership. And you know, perhaps I know we've got folks here from the Coast Guard Academy and West Point, and you hear all about leadership all the time. But I think we need to make sure that we make the distinction, first of all, that a leader is not the same thing as a boss. We all are leaders, and there are attributes about leadership that are important that have nothing to do about whether you're in charge or not. And from some of what you heard today, I think part of what needs to be the United States needs to think about when we talk about being a global leader is how do we be a global leader when we're not the boss? Because that's the situation where we are starting to see ourselves. But to frame what I mean by leadership, I have a, a model that I use, which I call the four C's of leadership. And they are the attributes that I see in a leader. The first of which is courage. Courage to act when others don't act. Courage to be the one that makes that first step, regardless of whether it's the decision about what your friends are going to do, hanging around one night to go to the movies or go try to get a drink at the bar even though you're underage. The courage to make that first step. The courage to make, do the right thing at the right time. And I put it to you that the, that the United States is still and maintains its global leadership because we do have the courage to act. And the example of that is the leadership role we took with the invasion of, of Russia into Ukraine. You heard Senator Blumenthal talk about the fact that the future of NATO was at risk. And you heard from our Canadian counterpart, but we had the courage to step up and do that. The second is competence, because frankly, courage without competence is foolishness. Running into a, a situation without knowing how to, how to handle it is not a good situation. And I pointed to you, I'm a basketball fan, and I point to you that nobody would pass the ball to Michael Jordan or LeBron James at the end of a game if they didn't think he could shoot, right? And it's the same thing for the United States. We have the competence. You heard from Chief Simmons about how our NCOs and the professionalism they have. I've heard comments said that about the Russian army, um, you can have a lot of people but if they don't have competence, if they're not trained, if they're not, they don't have the skills, if they don't have the tool sets, then you're not going to be a leader. I think the United States has that competence. And, and uh, it may be starting to be challenged a little bit, and we'll get into that. The third is commitment. I heard Senator Blumenthal use that word five times, right? Commitment. He talked about the commitment that we made and had the implications that it has. 
No one is going to follow you if they don't believe you're going to be there with them through the whole thing, period, dot. And that's a key part of our global leadership. And the last is compassion. If you think about it, I know a lot of military leaders, we hear about toxic leadership. Well, toxic leadership may have the other three, but if you don't have that compassion, if people don't, if you don't care about the people that you are trying to lead, they are, they will, you will not be effective. And the U.S., I would say, is still, even though we, we sometimes trip up, we have compassion, we care about people, and that's why any natural disaster that happens around the world, what's the first question? Where's the United States? Because they know we're going to be there. We're going to be there to, 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 to step in and care about people. And, and so now if we look at our leadership today, think about all those things when we talk about our national strategy. And I, as I was listening today, I decided, you know what, let me pull up our national strategy. And it happens to be dated the 14th of October of 2022. So we're coming up pretty close to the, to the first anniversary of the, of, our na of the current active strategy. And it talks about, the president talks about our enduring role as a leader. And he talks about, in the vision, he talks about two strategic challenges. The first of which we've talked a lot about today, which is the post-Cold War era competition that's underway. And that it's time for us to stand up to this new competition, which not directly said here, China, Russia, and how do we deal with this superpower competition. But he talks about a second risk that we challenge that we have to. And that is what he calls People all over the world are struggling to cope with the effects of shared challenges such as climate change, food insecurity, communicable diseases, terrorism, energy shortages, or inflation. And so I put it to you that when we look at us as a leader, that we need to think about both of those. And we talked a little bit about climate change because the stability to, for us to accomplish the global security that is critical to our national security, we cannot ignore that second set of risks. And if you look at what's evolved around the world, and we talk about tripwires, we've heard about tipping points, but we talk about tripwires to alert us. We've had a few of those in the last couple of years. The pandemic. If that wasn't a tripwire to communicate to us that our national security is a global issue, because for the centuries that we've existed as a country, we've looked at those two big oceans and friends of the north and friends to the south and said, we're secure. That virus was not stopped by those oceans. And, the, and then, so it is a critical part. So what is changing now in terms of potential series of tipping points like General Potter talked about and tripwires that I think we need to look at. And then, Mike, you can pick which of these you might want to talk about. The first is, is the interconnectivity that we have in the world. And that's illustrated by the tripwire we saw in the pandemic. And it has many attributes. We are now connected. We can no longer, a view of isolationism is not going to be an effective national security strategy or a global security strategy. And I point to you, and that's with information. Information is now ubiquitous. That presents both challenges and opportunities for us. Arab Spring is a tripwire in, in, in an illustration about information. January 6th is a tripwire about information and the ubiquitous availability about it. One good for us, one bad for us. A second aspect of it is this whole issue of um, climate change and the effect of what can be a, national, a natural disaster in one area that pervades the entire uh, globe. We see snippets of this when we heard earlier about the the smoke in Connecticut due to Canadian fires. Um, there is no more such thing anymore. Another aspect of it is there's no more such thing as a regional conflict. 
Russia invades Ukraine, gas prices go up, Europe worries about freezing in the, in, and India and Africa worry about where they're going to get their wheat. We no longer have regional conflicts. Um, we know another, um, another area that is a passionate to me is we no longer in the United States have a lock on technology development. We have always, our national strategy has always been to go after and protect some of the best technologies available. Stealth um, is an, a perfect example. And, and, but now, with the speed at which technology can be developed and the, the entry cost is so much lower, we heard from our, our AI specialist about how you can now you know, go out there using that ubiquitous information and quickly field technology in a, in a war fighting way. So we no longer have that advantage of taking 10 years to get a new technology out there because we can't protect it. So the speed at which technology changes and the, ability, the fact that we no longer have, that, uh, have a lock on that technology. And then I think there's one more, I gotta check my notes here that um, I want to, oh, the third area that I think is important for us to think about is, and we were talking about this earlier, Mike, it's no longer a bipolar world. It, the threshold to be influential and a leader is much lower than it used to be. And we can no longer look at our challenges as, as the Secretary of Air Force now says, China, China, China. Um, because it's not, we will, we will have alliances, but we, you will see pockets of leadership that will step up, and sometimes it's in a vacuum. We heard today about BRICS, which is, going, is, is an important economic leader, which is cl clearly, is, and is growing, and it's a recognition by countries like India and Turkey that they want to, uh, they see the opportunity to assert themselves and fill a vacuum if they feel like our leadership's not there. This gets to my point about how we have to think about being a leader without being the boss. And, and Turkey is an example. Turkey is a strong ally of the United States. They're a member of NATO. They're selling UAVs to Russia. They are uh, using Russian air defense systems. Should we walk away from them? We can't, right? So we have to look at the world not as a us against them, but as a, in a broader perspective. So, you know, again, the whole issue, Mike, of information availability, technology, and then, of course, the whole uh, context of it's not a bipolar world as much as we want to say the pro, you know, we're going against the Ukraine because we, we're concerned about Russia. We should be supporting Ukraine because of the imbalance it provides, it is in the whole global security uh, of, the, of, the, of the world, not because it deters just Russia, I, in my opinion. So, Mike, which one of those would you like to try to dig I, into? I, I think I'd like to talk about all three, but, but really, if, if you, as we as you look through the framework that you that that you just discussed ma'am what as you look at that what is the one or two tripwires or triggers that most concern you when we when we look out at this new evolving environment based on the the big 3 okay so you know i'm a i'm a techno geek i uh, uh, i and so i tend to think a lot about the implications of technology. And I will tell you that I think the, a major tipping point, and we've already seen some of the triggers, is artificial intelligence. And now let me take a step back and talk about that in the context that I mean it. Um, we tend to immediately gravitate when we talk about artificial intelligence and national security to autonomy and putting in the hands of, uh, let's just say, executing um, violence on people independently of a human in the loop. That, you know, that's when we talk about artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence 
has a much broader impact on global security than the pointy end of the sword. And by that, I mean artificial intelligence will enable us to react quicker, to bring about new capabilities, and to respond to changing threats in ways that we're not thinking about when we're only thinking about the pointy end of the sword in artificial intelligence. What do I mean by that? Artificial intelligence is being used today to more quickly do designs and mature technology. One of the programs that's, being, that's under development now within uh, RTX, which Mike and I are both uh, associated with, is long-range standoff weapon. Artificial intelligence is being applied through things like digital twin and digital thread to very quickly um, do that design based on inputs that are collected from what's going on around the world. Then the next phase is, how do I quickly go from that beautiful thing that's electrons on, as we used to say, on paper design into a real piece of hardware that I can hand to the soldier or the sailor, the airman, marines, or coast guardmen to make, to make an effect. Additive manufacturing, you heard, about, you heard that reference today. It is powered by artificial intelligence. I now take those same electrons. I don't have to have a human in the loop. I hand put that into the... 3D printer, and I produce the new product. Artificial intelligence enables me to maintain that system by allowing me to constantly monitor what's, what's happening with it and to make sure that when that airman that's repairing the aircraft on, at the, at the, uh, on the airfield or um, repairing the, uh, the, the, the Bradley, to have everything, to have the whole supply chain immediately alerted, knowing when the parts need to be there and what's broken, and, the, and to predict ahead of time that a part's going to break and fix and get it fixed before, or replaced before it breaks while you're relying on it to uh, protect you from, from an attack. Training, one of the key things that takes us so long to bring a new capability on is what it takes to train our forces to use that. Applying artificial intelligence in the loop to help to train. And artificial intelligence smart enough to be able to recognize the individual person's needs in training. So that I now can, can use artificial intelligence to not take a year and a half to retrain somebody when they move from an F-22, F say, to an F-35, but I can do it in a much shorter time because the training is tailored and perfect for that person. So across the spectrum, artificial intelligence is going to enable us to react quicker across all of the things that have caused us to have 10-year cycles to bring a new capability in. And so in my mind, when we look at what are the true tipping points? And it, we are at that cusp of boiling water, as the, uh, as the <laughs> Professor Mill yeah, <laughs> said, um, when it comes to artificial intelligence, as long as we recognize that it, the tremendous power it can have, not just, and not get ourselves focused purely on do we want to trust a machine to make the decision? Because frankly, we will never trust a machine to, to make a decision. Um, but we will become really, really close to, to doing that by, enable, by allowing artificial intelligence to get us there faster. I, I, I think that it really leads to a charge to our um, to our next generation of security leaders to not focus on the far right or left bookend of what AI should not do. And you're, it's going to be this, the responsibility of this generation to tell us what it can do in order to increase decision speed um, for humans and to increase that, um, that technology development um, in order to speed capabilities to the field uh, 
to support uh, in, in all aspects uh, of our economy and national defense. So it, it, it is a really important point. If you, if you listen to the debate, it is the majority of the time is talking about what AI should never be allowed to do rather than focusing on what can, how can we use AI to increase our decision uh, fidelity for our decisions and our decision speed. I think it's a really important point. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I do want to leave time for some questions. Um, if, uh, if there are some burning questions out there, I'll, uh, I'll, let, um, I'll let anybody, uh, any, yes, sir, in the back here. <clears throat> oh, well, I'll, get, I'll come to right to you next, sir. Sorry. Okay, so I know the internet's replete with memes for people that ask questions on Friday afternoon at 3.15, but I'm gonna be that guy anyway. <laughs> so, uh, General, Generals, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, question is, and, I, and it's, it's uh, pertinent to the point that you made about our national security strategy coming up on its one year anniversary. You know, our, our uh, competitors, China primarily, are dynastic thinkers, and they've put these, uh, they put their objectives on a 25-year, 50-year, 100-year timeline, and ours is on a four-year cycle, really, and it's, and it's up and down and, you know, left and right based off of, uh, you know, the party that might be in charge. So my question to you is, how do you think that impacts our ability to actually be successful over the long term? Um, in that in that context, thank you. Well, you first of all, I, I agree with you that the, the the Chinese are very prolific at putting out these 25, 30 year strategies, and they are fortunate that they have had stability in their leadership and had had economic success for many years that has allowed them to stay on that path. Um, but I personally don't believe there is structure. They are as pre are any more prepared than we are to deal with the kind of dynamic change that we're going to see in the globe. And a perfect example of that was the pandemic. You know, they took what was a very draconian approach of completely shutting down the whole country. They developed a vaccine that was far less effective than the one that we did. Um, and they have continued to struggle to get out of that, right? Where, so I, I, I'm all for long-term strategies, um, and I wish we could do more of that in this country. But I will tell you, I think the success of us against a... a uh, a country like China or Russia that, you know, has ambitions to, to uh, play a domineering role as opposed to a leadership role in, in the world is um, our ability to, to be agile and to adapt. And so I would prefer to look at ways to posture ourselves to be able to affect change quickly. Um, rather than to look at the longer term strategy, um, because the, and so um, we have done things um, at, over the years that we now are awakening that were mistakes. You know, I'll give you the whole world of hypersonics, right? I mean, hypersonics is not new, guys. I mean, those of us who have been studying this technology, it's been around for a long, long time. Um, but we decided that um, we would not do testing and we would rely on just create, you know, a lot of paper, you know, doing a lot of analysis and a lot of computer simulation. The Chinese took the brute force approach, which was going to take them longer, of tons of tests. And we hear about them all now. Uh, we made a mistake. Because when we finally decided that, that, that oh, but boy, we need, uh, we need some of these hypersonic things, and we turned around, and guess what? Having been a, I'm a hardware kind of gal as a technologist, when we built the first one and we tested it, 
assuming we could do it without a whole lot of testing, guess how many failures in our fellow national security contractor, Lockheed Martin, who you heard about today? <laughs> you know, failure after failure after failure. And the answer was we needed more testing, right? So there, I'm not, it's not to say that we are, that we are more, we are better than the Chinese in terms of our long-term strategy, because we, we had a long-term strategy and we, we adjusted it. But I think, I, I think that instead of focusing on how do I um, um, best, you know, compare myself to this 25-year strategy, I, I think our approach used to be how do I position us to best be able to more agilely adapt tech, not just technology, but everything um, to, a, to an ever-changing world so that we can be better prepared to deal with what is going to be a dynamic world. Because we are going to see tipping points. And uh, we're going to get to that boiling point. So my view about 25-year plans is posture yourself to address these challenges and do the things we can uh, and be prepared to change when we need to. You know, I think probably the best way to wrap this up is um, we heard a lot about seeing something that was in a movie or in a book become reality. And when you, when you ask to look at what the future looks like um, and where we might be, frankly, I turn to science fiction because that's where we see you know, that vision, right, and what's going to happen. And if you look at science fiction today and you look at what could the world look like in 100 years where your grandchildren will be there, and you, you can see there may be, there's two, two realms of the scenario. One is the uh, apocalypse, if I said that word correctly, where you see people back to using you know, sticks and, and uh, rocks max. because, you know, we've had global nuclear war and there's, you know, people can't, can only live in these pockets and in caves. And then you have Star Trek where you have this world where people are living free and they are sharing resources and they... Uh, don't worry about where, where you know, that we are trying to, you know, to help to, to provide a world. And I ask you, which one would you rather live in? And I think if we want to work towards the vision that Star Trek prevents, presents as opposed to the, to the other, then we have to start to look at that now. We have to look at national security as equivalent to global security. And we can't say, we can't now run and say, Russia, Russia, you know, now it's Ukraine, so it's Russia, Russia, Russia. Um, before that, it was China, China, China. And in the Air Force, it's still China, China, China. And, and by the way, for the first half of my military career, it was the Soviet Union. And then for the second half of my career, it was, as, as the former chief, General Goldfein was saying, chasing after little green men around uh, Southwest Asia, right? We have to, um, so I can't tell you whether China's even going to be here, in, but I know that the Chinese people will be there, right? I mean, think about for me how many different Russias that I've seen. You know, when I first joined the Air Force, it was the Soviet Union and, you know, the primary focus was the nuclear war. Then the, then the wall went down and I found myself by direction of the, of uh, Condoleezza Rice, by the way, on the F-35, then called the JSF, trying to, to figure out how we were going to use a Russian ejection seat because we were trying to cooperate with the the, the Russians. Then 15 years later, I'm finding myself working in launch, trying to figure out how I'm going to get off of the RD-180 Russian-built engine, because all of a sudden, that was right after Russia invaded Crimea. And now I'm, you know, so what, what China am I going to be looking at 
in 25 years. I put it to you, it's not going to be the same China that's there today. So we have to be prepared. The best way we can do it is to not try to do it ourselves, to build relationships around the world that we can call upon, just like Senator Blumenthal talked about this new relationship um, with respect to the subs. Long answer to your question, but I think it kind of sums it up. Thank you, General Paul Cussie. All right. Really Thanks, appreciate Mike. it. Again, thank you, everybody, for being here and, st and sticking it out. Thank you.